Welcome to our second episode where we are discussing episode three of House of the Dragon because we discussed episodes one and two in the previous episode that we did of this and now we are just discussing episode three. I am joined by the lovely Lady Mare um, from Lady Mare Reads on all the socials. <laughs> so let's get into it. What are your overall thoughts on episode three? <laughs> I'm not a massive fan. Okay. I really, I wasn't a fan of it. I expected a lot more than it gave. And I was leaving, like, I was going, oh, is that it? Is that it? For, like, the whole episode. Which, yeah. And I have spoken to a few other people who stopped watching it on episode one and two because they just got bored. Oh, my. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and then another friend messaged me and she went, how dare you? Because she's a massive Game of Thrones fan. Uh-huh. So I might be in the minority here, but I'm not totally in love. Um, uh-huh. I am hoping it's going to, but like halfway point, it will pick up. But I'm trying to lower my expectations. Yeah. I enjoyed it for the most part. Uh, I think overall this season, I think I'm pretty positive on the show. I, there are, like, some things that happened in this episode that I'm like, I enjoyed watching this scene play out, but I don't think it was super realistic for the characters. <laughs> or it just kind of yeah. felt like the characters are going along without very much of a plan. So that was, like, I'm going to say, like, my, my only critique is, like, I some of these th- scenes were really fun to watch, but th- I'm not sure how they fit into the overall story. So... Those those are my thoughts. But it was still, like, I enjoyed my time watching it. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't downright hating it. I just mm-hmm. wanted a little bit more. Maybe I've got Game of Thrones hanging over my head too much. <laughs> Maybe. No, well, the early, early seasons of Game of Thrones. Don't talk about last season. There, there we go. <laughs> so, yeah, that's definitely a possibility. Was there any, I'm going to say, like, standout positive moments in the episode there was a few moments that did surprise me actually um let's look at my notes the one that really surprised me uh was damon actually and it's just one line uh your grace i know I literally oh have a God. note going like your grace with so many exclamation marks and like emojis uh-huh. next to it. Like, oh my God. Even though I called the fact that he was going to Harren Hall, I was like, that's Harren Hall. Obviously, that's Harren Hall. Um, and obviously, because I'm reading the book, I know there's like not like a prophecy that, that happened with Damon, but most people who end up going into Harren Hall don't end up surviving. So, not going into Harren Hall. That's, who own it in a sense, run it, that kind of thing, because it's derelict and all of that. And it started from Egg on the Conqueror. So it's been from then. So I'm kind of suspecting of what's going to happen to Damon there, especially when they go like the prophecy at the end, like you will die here. I'm like, oh, okay. My suspicion is possibly correct. So, but that was interesting um mm, but they still wanted more from it i'd still expecting him to go and do more than what he actually did because it sounded like especially later on that rhaenyra sent him when when they left it on episode two it was kind of like but it looked like he just left her and then yeah. when you get the whole your grace moment i was like oh okay we're now having having, having another king <laughs> in west which actually would be a really good point. I'd love that to happen, but also not love it to happen because I like Rhaenyra, <laughs> but also Damon. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's a good follow up to their argument because Damon never answered Rhaenyra's question of whether or not he accepts her as queen. And I think this is just kind of cementing the fact that he he wants the throne. Um, I mean, everyone in the show basically wants, they want the power of the throne, whether or not they want to sit oh, in yeah. it themselves. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's kind of cementing, like, 
he, that's his ultimate goal. Uh, he does want to be looked up to like that. He does. And he's, I think we went over this last episode, but he's very, very prideful. And he, I think at this point, Rhaenyra has pushed him to take what he wants. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, I didn't think he felt he could take what he wanted when his brother was alive. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there is that. Do I think he'll make a good king? No. He's a little bit too bloodthirsty, personally. I think he'll just be another Joffrey. <laughs> but I still like him as a character. He's probably one of the most compelling characters. Oh, yeah. And I thought his scenes in Heron Hall were some of the best in the episode. Definitely, like, a highlight of the episode. Just oh, it was the best. Um, the best one was the dream scene. That well, it was and wasn't a dream scene because it ended up coming out. That was the best one, how it ended, because I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a glimpse into his uh, consciousness. Well, no. whenever there was the rattling on the door, I was like, it's haunted. And then I was like, wait, can ghosts go through the doors? Why would it be rattling? <laughs> but then whenever he went out, <laughs> yeah. but whenever he went, he like went out the door and then he like had this vision. I was like, oh my gosh, the vision was, it chills. Like it was so good. And, and the fact that Rhaenyra was just like sewing the head so, back on. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. And then whenever like the vision broke and he was like standing there, I was like, it's a god's wood. He's standing by a god's wood tree. I saw I saw that, yeah. Oh my gosh. And, and I have no idea who the woman was because we did see her like whenever he first came to Heron or whenever yes, he first saw the people. Yes. I was like, is she real or is she a vision? Because like I don't know. I think she's real from some people who I've watched who've reviewed episode three who have read the book say she does appear in the book. I still don't know who she is. But okay. from the way they panned to her and then the prophecy she left, I'm kind of like, you must be somebody important that's going to come up later. Yeah, like, no, what was really interesting was whenever they fir very first saw her is when like the entire family was like, bowing to Damon, Damon and then she just like walks yeah. in the room and she stands there and yeah. doesn't bow down and obviously whenever that happened you're like okay she's important somehow and at that point I thought she was real but yeah. then after like whenever he saw her after the vision I was like well now I'm not 100% sure that she's real but yeah. yeah and then the fact that she said you will die here I'm not sure if that means like he's going to die this visit or if like this is where he will die even if he leaves, I took it as that. he will he will die at Harren Hall. Mm -hmm. So because he's claimed it, I take it as you're probably going to die because you've claimed it, um, and stuff like that. So, and it will probably be at Harren Hall. They say that he'll do it. How it will come about will be really interesting, I think. And I have no idea how it will come about. I have a rough idea. Of Rhaenyra, but no idea about Damon. Um, but yeah, it would definitely. I have well, when I say I have, some people have fan theories of who the woman is, and I can tell you. Or do you want to go in blind? Are you can and then me. when we it gets okay, you want to know? <laughs> some <sorry>. people. <laughs> some people suspect she could be Melisandre. No. If you don't watch the, no. yeah, yeah, <laughs> I don't think so. Well, she can, yeah. Well, she can change faces, I mean, can't she? So she can. That's true. I mean, I'm not inclined know, to believe that theory either, but it's one of the theories that's that's out there. We know, like Melisandre can like make herself appear younger, but like, doesn't this happen like hundreds of years before the Game of Thrones story? Yes, um, but at the same time, I have feeling that Melisandre again is one of those people who can live for years so it's not just an age thing I still don't want to believe it but I like the she could yeah, she could be like it. one of the red priestesses I yeah. could I think I think I could accept like she's one of the red priestesses I don't know about like her being Melisandre I think from a story point I wouldn't do that because 
it's tying too much into Game of Thrones, where while this is set in the game, same world and it is Game of Thrones, it's still very separate from the original TV show and books. Mm-hmm. So to make it more separate, you wouldn't really tie into any of the characters unless it's like with the book, you would mention later on like Daenerys as a Targaryen kind of thing because it's a mm-hmm. history of the Targaryens. But I don't think it would go that far ahead for the book. It's more of a history than... I'm trying to remember what it said in the first episode, but I thought it said that, I want to say it was like 500 years before Daenerys, but I mean, it was just like mentioned like at the very first episode of season one, and then we haven't really, okay, obviously they've talked about the prophecy, the Song of Ice and Fire, but they haven't really gone like talking about stuff that happens. Okay, again, We've not gone back to the north. We've seen the wall. So I feel like there's more, I feel like it's more things that allude to stuff that we are already familiar with from A Game of Thrones, but it's not like it's specific characters. So we've met some yeah. of the Starks, you know, like we've, uh, I think in whenever they were bowing to Rhaenyra and saying like, we pledge like you will be the next heir or whatever. I think one of the characters was a Baratheon. We've talked about the Tyrells. Like it makes sense that these houses would still be prominent um, in in both the past and in the Game of Thrones world. So I think that makes a lot of sense. But as far as like actually having a character like Melisandre, I don't know about that. No, I'm not really inclined to think that would be true either. Personally, it's just what some people have said. I'm like, okay, that's a theory. I think you're a bit far far fetching on that one. But. Well, I find I find it really interesting. Um, so let's say she is like a red priestess or something. Was she causing the vision? Because or was this more like a dream sequence? Because I think that would like change the way we view Damon. Because you could say this is a dream and this is something like Damon very outwardly is very callous, but maybe deep down. It does actually bother him a little bit. Whereas if this is a a vision that's like thrust upon him, then he's n- not necessarily wrestling with any guilt over this. And he's maybe being like, it's kind of maybe the, you know, uh, some magic priestess, whatever is trying to make him wrestle with that, but not something that he's coming to on his own. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I took it as he had a vision vision dream kind of thing kind of slept walked and then came out of it as she walked into the room that's very possible. into the into the godswood that's how that's how i took it and then she just said like you will die here which is ominous enough and somebody came up to me and said you will die here i'd be like what the fuck are you going about oh yeah and, uh, i would probably leave i would just leave uh but damon's too prideful for that so yeah, that's, that's how I took it, and but also it's it's hard because we I think hopefully next episode or as we go through, we will maybe see more about who she actually is and what mm-hmm. kind of power she's got. Mm-hmm. So it should be, which will give us more answers. But at the moment, we're sort of reaching into the dark a little bit. But this that's that's how I took it, and I have in my head that she's more of like a witch, but we don't quite know how like it's like with melisandre like the, the red priestesses like they're kind of witches but they're not because they're following the god and they're saying the god gets some power and stuff like that but then you have the faceless men like how do they get their kind of power and do all that so there's so much stuff that probably is in this in the world that we don't know we don't know how much power everybody has which is which leaves the door open for a lot of speculation mm-hmm I think just kind of anecdotally, I thought uh, whenever I very first watched through a Game of Thrones or the the TV show, I couldn't quite figure out. I was like, does Melisandre have power or is she just tricking everyone and making them believe she has power? And then watching, because I watched the first few seasons a, a second time. And whenever I did that, I was like, it seems so obvious that she actually does have power. <laughs> So I find it interesting, like even this, like we could be speculating of like, was this from her or not? I wonder how we're going to think about it whenever we look back on it once we have more information. Well, yeah, but then you also got to think about that the Tarkarians actually have power because mm-hmm. they contain dragons. Mm-hmm. And it's 
the way it's alluded to, it's they have this power, fire and blood, especially with Daenerys in, you know, the first season. Um, she doesn't get burned, which is, again, another thing. And it's another thing with the Red Priests as well. So there's quite a few little power eluding people that kind of go through all throughout Westeros and uh, beyond the other. I'm blanking on the other Pentos, that sort of place over the seas so and there's also more that comes up that you will get to that's in season two the clash of kings of the book um so there is quite a lot throughout there so obviously it's a very a world that is is full of magic but most people just don't have it or mm -hmm. if it is magic they allude it to a certain god would give it to them and it's mm -hmm. one of those ones, are the gods actually real? Is that what gave them, like, the Targaryens power of the dragons? Or is it just something they all, you know, they just had? Or is it just, like, people call it gods when actually it was just somebody who was really powerful? Yeah. I fact. think in some ways because we follow, I don't know, the way the way the show presents the characters, you can kind of forget that this is a world that's full of magic. But it really is a world that's full of magic. We're just not necessarily yeah. following like powerful magic users or something. No, it's the way it's done. It's kind of how I would allude it to Lord of the Rings, right? Right now, now I'm going to get my technical right brain. I'm going to allude it to the way Lord of the Rings goes because you have some hard magic systems with within like like the Ring, and then you have the Elves, right? They're kind of mm -hmm. like the magical beings in a sense. But then you have people like the Hobbits and the dwarves and the men who are just don't have access to this at all unless they're like wearing a ring or something that would give them them power so i allude it to a bit like that the most people just go through their lives no magic just chilling out but then you have the few people who would just like elves would have these kind of powers but it'd be soft we don't know much about it as a reader which makes it more magical in, in the sense Mm -hmm. on on how it goes so then but then anything can happen yeah but the way that would fail would be if they use that as a way for solving a problem mm -hmm. so i don't mind them getting them into trouble like danaris just having her dragons causes a lot of trouble by no fault of her own because people are like dragons we either want to take the dragons or we want to destroy the dragons because dragons have not been good <laughs> On the world before so and and it goes all in and it's just in it that's how it kind of went it just so interesting there's so much stuff you can you can do with it and like first law by joe abercrombie does it as well it doesn't hardly have any magic in it it's very soft but it gives that kind of oh what could happen mm -hmm. because you know and then you're left with the characters always finding their way out without having to use certain magic which just makes it far more compelling as a reader and as, like as a watcher Mm -hmm. in, in, in my opinion well i'm gonna even compare it to robin hobbs realm of the elderlings like her world oh, yeah. is full of magic but i mean fitz has some magical skills but particularly like in the farseer trilogy he's not really skilled at using them he's he like he has some abilities but he doesn't know how to control it and then even in the live ship traders series we're not necessarily following the characters who have magic so they they interact with a world that has magic in it but they're not yeah. ones that are like controlling magic and i find that really interesting actually to, like we're following i'm gonna say the regular folk in a world full of magic yeah but what i like about what robin hobb does which what lord of the rings and game of thrones won't do is she will trickle this small slither of information throughout the 16 books mm -hmm. of the magic system going through so then you learn more because i read the last trilogy first so i already knew about the magic system because <laughs> you start off with learning this i was like this is all of fun i'm loving this not realizing it was like book 13 or something <laughs> but anyway it made sense and i did like it but then as you go back through you go like you don't know anything about it in like the first trilogy and you get to the uh, the tawny man trilogy like Oh, you learn a little bit more as you go along, and it's just—I just love how that's done. Yeah, I've only read the first two trilogies. 
<laughs> but I mean, whenever the last trilogy was coming out, I think was whenever I was starting to become more aware of Robin Hobb. So I could have easily done the same thing, just like picked because it's it's the first of a trilogy. Obviously, you could start there. Well, that's what I not, did. I not s- realizing how yeah. the world connects. Well, it, I've got them in, in hardback. Out of all of the Remley Oldlings, the last three are in hardback because I bought them on publication year. Ah. Because the first one, I was like, I saw it on the shelf. I loved it, looked at it, read the blurb. I went, oh, I'm coming home with that. And then read it. And then by the time I'd actually got my reading, book two had come out. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, I'll just get book two. Then I went, oh, hang on. There's more books. (laughs) (laughs) I did buy book three. Didn't read books. It took me ages to get the courage to read book three. Mm -hmm. Because by that point, I'd gone through all of Fitz's stories. And then I just had that, and I was like, that's the last of Fitz's stories. And, yeah, it took yeah. me over a year to read it because I was just terrified. Rightly mm-hmm. so. But I was ter- it's really good, but I, this broke me so much. So much. Yeah. I Well, and I think that's part of the reason why I haven't really continued the series because I've, I've heard – I love the story so much. But at the same time, like, I don't want them to be over. I don't want to speed through the entire realm of the Elder Link. And then, like, so... I know I can always go back and reread it, but, like – well, if uh, this helps, if this helps, Robin Hobb is currently still writing in Realm of the Oldlings. I know. Whether or not anything's going to be published anytime soon is a different matter. Because I think she just does it at her own leisure pace. Mm-hmm. But it's it does end on a really good conclusion. I so you can that. just you can just read it and class it, okay, that's it, that's done. Mm-hmm. and try and peel yourself off the floor as you <laughs> cry yourself into a ball of tears. But <laughs> it's, it's really good. It is really good. You should definitely, definitely go by it. But anyway, we should probably talk about House of the Dragon. The show. Actually, <laughs> 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 Robin Hood. We'll get back to House of the Dragon. <laughs> I think we talk about Robin Hood all day long. But <laughs> should I go through one of my first notes and just go down? Sure. My loss, because... Um, I literally, I said this out loud, I went, Jesus fucking Christ, on like the first or second clip, when you just saw all the bodies. I know! All the bodies, I was like, ooh, because I quite like how that how they showed the two warring sides. Um, yes. And they've, and they've been feuding for years, like years. Uh-huh. And that, that was definitely, that was interesting. Um, but... Yeah, and then as we get to learn more about them throughout the episode and why that might have happened. Yes, I think they they were there just to show like uh, descent throughout, like the knights and more common people. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it was still, but also it alludes to the fact that the Riverlands are just warring with each other. Yes, as well, which I think will come to fruit in the next episode. And it'll be mm-hmm. interesting to see who will win. I predict a big battle. I predict more dragons. But it all depends on where they're going to go and what happens and if what will happen with Damon, because I'm a bit... I don't know on that front. Uh, but that was definitely... That was that was interesting, because they definitely wrapped up the gore in this episode. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, the side yeah. of the head. Also, also just the blowjob scene. I was like, you know, the first couple episodes were like kind of mild for like Game of Thrones, and then they were like, just reminder, <laughs> this is Game of Thrones. I know, I know. I mean, I see, I see what, 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 why, why they did that because it was yeah. really good for Aemon. I want to say Aemon, the guy with the eye patch. I probably should have a cast of characters up. I'm gonna talk and Google the cast of characters. Yeah. It is a cast there. Um. Because, especially, like, when you see him in a vulnerable moment and his brother comes in and, like, th- that, I can see how that works. But going back to the plot, <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> I was like, I don't understand how that works. Because it just didn't look, I don't know, there was something just off about it, personally. I just, that particular, even though it was, like, a second clip, it's been stuck in my head because I was like, that just didn't look right. Something, I don't know. 
Well, it makes it makes sense with like Amen because it was something in like in the story that we're seeing, whereas that was just it was kind of like a background character. We don't even know these people. This is just going on in the background, yes. <laughs> but it's actually in the foreground of the shot. Yeah, and when you think about like watching all of Game of Thrones, hang on, I think my thing's just. Let's turn this off really quickly. Otherwise, you might be able to hear it. Tanks heating up. Um, when you look at Game of Thrones, it never went into that shock factor. Like, there was a lot of stuff that went on, more centered on women. So, I do like the fact that they were like, we will show men as well. I like that aspect of it. But it never went that far. But also, as well, half of it is you had the first episode of like hardly anything, not a lot, even in season one. Then, mm-hmm. bam, blowjob right in front of you on the, on the screen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I mean, okay. This definitely is Game of Thrones. Definitely is uh, is a, a reminder. But yeah, which was it's fine. Maybe I'm just not into that kind of thing anymore. But anyway, no, I, I think it's a fair comment. My next note was literally Kristen Cole is still a prompt prick. Yes. Mm. Very much it. I am super excited that they spotted him though. Whenever he was out riding with the men, and that oh, yeah. uh, I I don't remember her name. It's not Raina. Well, on the dragon, mm-hmm. it is Raina. Is it Raina? Yeah, but isn't Raina the older woman too? Are there two Raynas? Maybe it is Raina. <laughs> I want to say yes, but it won't show me the whole list. I like that she spotted them. And I think that's going to make things more interesting. And I like that she actually knew it was him. Yeah. I feel like Rhaenyra has not gotten over her feelings for him. And I'm mad about that (laughs) because of Rhaenyra's reaction. I was just like, no, you can let him go. He's like, it's fine. (laughs) Um, I feel like from Rhaenyra's reaction, like she's not actually gotten over him. Unfortunately, because I think it would be more interesting if she hadn't. <laughs> Mostly just because oh. I don't like him. <laughs> God, I really want him to make a really bad mistake and then die. That's what I really want for him. Um, I think he's but... too annoying for that yet. <sighs> yeah. I still don't like him, though. I still don't like him. I'm still looking up for the character name because it's, it's bugging me. Um, but it's not showing me because she's only on the screen for like two seconds. Which is... It's fine. Um, going back to the chase, though, when you see Crystal go and then like the dragon chase. Why didn't the dragon breathe fire? I, I understand. I know, there was like a lot of, you know... I know they sort of said later on, like, Rhaenyra said not to engage. But I'm like, you had him right there. You could have just killed the hand. Mm-hmm. I mean, I like Alicent's brother. I would have been sad about Alicent's brother. But it was an opportunity and you missed it. Although I did like the fact that we got to see more of the dragons in this. And now, you know, they flew and all of that stuff. Okay. But as soon as Alicent's, as soon as we meet Alicent's brother, I said, he's going to die. I was like, he's going to die. There's no way. He lives very long. And then particularly the way there's like animosity between him and Chris and Cole. I was just like, he's not going to live very long. And so whenever we saw the dragon coming, I also thought the same thing. I was like, yes, kill them. Take them out. (laughs) And then the dragon's just like circling over the woods. And I'm just like, burn it all down. (laughs) See, I didn't necessarily think that he was going to die because... I have a feeling Alison is planning something. Because, do you remember in the previous episode, was it her her other son or her brother that was in Old Town? I can't remember. That, I don't know. Yeah, because obviously they said to send for one of them, but then he arrived. But obviously he's her brother, so whatever the reason for him coming there... I just have a feeling, especially how Alison reacted to Kristen Cole 
after introducing her brother and her brother being like, I'm going to go on the mission with you, it kind of says that Aris has said, like, go on the mission and make sure they don't fuck up. Because I just get the impression she doesn't trust Dickhead Cole. At all. You might be right. You might be right. And that would make a lot of sense, like, Chris and Cole is noticing that, and then he's being, you know, antagonistic towards the brother, and then he's also, like, asking Alicent for her favor and all of that. So, like, he's trying to make sure that he's still, like, in her good graces, I guess. So, I guess, yeah. like, that makes that makes perfect sense, like, how to read that scene. That's how I took it, especially when you, you know, Alicent's reaction to Cole after was quite cold. Mm -hmm. And, like, she didn't really want to show him any affection. didn't really want to give him her favour. But she was like, well, you've asked, so, okay. I can't really refuse. But, yeah, I think she's realising that he may not be the right person. Well, and I didn't know, I'm going to say, like, why is she cold towards him? Because I thought, like, Kristen Cole was very cold towards Alison's brother initially and i think like allison was not happy with the idea that kristen cole's gonna leave because he's like leaving her so i mean maybe she's upset like i guess i didn't see it as a bigger plot that she's like sending her brother along to make sure things are okay i thought like maybe she was just like upset with kristen cole for leaving at all i took it as more because they were conferring together first and then it was like oh he's going on the thing with you and it was Alison who said that and not her brother. Mm -hmm. So it was cut to me that implies that she was like, I want you to go on and keep an eye on everything. Maybe. Because he's her brother, she would talk to him a bit more. She's the Dowager Queen, so she still has some power in the world. Very little, but some. So that's that's how I took it. And that's what I liked more. I was like, give me more of that scheming. And then mm -hmm. it fizzled off after that because it doesn't didn't really come to anything. Because especially when you take Alison and, and Rhaenyra's conversation at the end, that had the power to be so strong and so motivational and so growing of the characters. And it just didn't really work. It seemed very unnecessary. Especially if Alison, obviously she did write to Rhaenyra, because she doesn't want it to come to a war. But at the same time, it's like, well, why meet in King's Land? Why not just kind of go, well, let's go to this remote place or like and meet together and talk rather than actually. Go I wouldn't know what was in Allison's letter because I feel like yes. we're missing that. And I feel like that was necessary for the scene to make sense. And obviously, why they didn't go to some remote place is because Rhaenyra thinks Allison won't meet with her. And she also has, like, she's going to have a ton of security or whatever with her. And it's probably going to get back to Aegon and all of that. I don't know. Like, I, I kind of see Rhaenyra's reasoning. What I don't understand. About, so, okay. I'm first going to talk about what I loved about this scene. I love okay. that we have Allison and Rhaenyra in the same room together again. Oh, and yeah. so we have, like, two people on opposite sides of this war. And it's like, they need to sit down and talk about it. Because they used to be friends. And, like, I loved that. And I, I love the tension in the scene. And I thought overall, the scene was decent. What was Rhaenyra's plan? What on earth was Rhaenyra's plan? Because she's yeah. like, I don't want war. I am not stepping aside. I am going to be queen. I'm like, well, then there was nowhere to go. Like, what were you showing up to do? Like, you were showing up to ask for surrender? Because that's what Alicent first said. Like, oh, you don't want war? Well, are you surrendering? It's like, there, there was it, no planning going into this like what was the plan no no i think half of it was she wanted to see if she could almost talk allison out of her son becoming king in a sense although by this point it's too late because oh, yeah. i don't see any other way of it and nobody else really would it would be delusional if you were because you want to be queen you are the rightful queen mm -hmm. and yet somebody else has taken your throne mm -hmm. and the only way you're going to win that is through war yeah you win the crown yeah so and I, allison allison and aegon are literally in king's landing they are literally like in the palace they have i'm gonna say the stronger uh position 
as far as like who has the throne right now? Well, they have the stronger position, but they also have more backing because when you think about the Game of Thrones world, it's very rarely that anybody will willingly back a woman, especially somebody like Rhaenyra, who was very just a little bit cold to a lot of people in her, in her younger life. And then obviously she grew older, grew a lot wiser and then and grew better but a lot of people will be thinking especially when you when you take the fact that it's more of the men are in control of certain provinces like you get the tullies you get the starks you get get all of that they're the people who who will decide whose banners follows who so they're going to go well i'll just follow the bloke i don't want to follow a woman so there are a few who do um but again, a lot of people who do follow her, I think, are people who are thinking, one, I believe that you could be a better, like, bring something better to the world, and two, I'll probably get something out of it. Mm-hmm. Totally. When you take in into that account. So, it's all... They do have the stronger backing. Rhaenyra is weaker, especially when you take her hesitancy to want to do anything that so again i think that's why she went to Alison because she doesn't want to commit to really just making the first step making it really really bloody she's fearful of losing her other children hence the reason why she sent two of them away mm-hmm. and they are very young um she sent those two away so and then but then she's also again what she also realizes is what her counselors don't realize is as soon as a dragon enters the wall, that mean that means all bets are off in a sense, and it's like okay, we'll just be gritty, bloody, we'll kill each other. Whereas at the moment, I understand uh, the what's his face who died in episode yeah, season one. That wasn't planned; it was kind of a mistake, and you can kind of see see that but then if you do it intentionally then it's like ah okay now we've really got to commit to everything and then everything kind of just goes fire and blood as it were burns yeah yeah i mean me and my partner were talking like if i was in westeros i think i would be backing aegon or i would like because the whole marketing around this is like choose your side and i think i would be backing aegon because they literally spelled out in season one there's never been a woman on the iron throne he seems to have like a pre like historical precedent he has the stronger claim to the throne um he is literally in king's landing he can literally sit on the iron throne right now like obviously if you're a peasant you don't really want anyone to be at war because you don't because like we even had in this show them the sheep farmer saying they took all my sheep to feed the dragons you know, like obviously you don't want war you don't maybe don't really care who's in charge as long as they're not taking your livelihood <laughs> but at the same time like yeah. i don't feel like rhaenyra has that I, she has a strong claim in the fact that her father named her heir and never went back on that despite having sons afterwards but Allison is claiming on, you know, with his dying breath, he did go back on, on that. And, you know, that's what she's telling everyone. And that's how she's, like, claiming the throne. But at the same time, like, Aegon is the oldest male heir. Okay. And he's we're literally gonna, in King's Landing. We're going to swing back to that for a second. Right. Okay. So, so, <laughs> Alicent's dying words. This is what I loved about that scene. It was all a misunderstanding. And mm-hmm. that was like, oh, and Alison suddenly realised this and went, shit, and then I can't go back on it because she thought, like, oh, obviously. Um, he he was saying Aegon. She didn't, he didn't obviously say her words, but I found it really interesting. And they're like, oh, he always talks about, like, the Prince of the Promise because, obviously, it's Aegon the Conqueror, and then, obviously, he's also called Aegon because that's what they do in a lot of historical things, especially when, like, if you look at, because uh, it's obviously based on, on British, like, monarchy and stuff like that. So you get a lot of, if you go down the British monarchy, a lot of them will be called the same, but sometimes mm-hmm. they'll have a different name, but they will just revert to, like, Edward, even though they're not called Edward, so they'll be King Edward V, even though their original name wasn't that, but he will be known as King Edward V. Yeah. So, which is really, like, super interesting and, like, loves that tiny little snippet of that and Alison's realisation of, oh, I was wrong. <laughs> but also knowing that, like, well, he's going to stay the throne, so... 
Well, and I think she, I think she does realize she was wrong in that moment, but she also knows like she she's not going to go back and tell she's not going to go back and tell anyone that she was wrong. I don't There's... see Aegon knowing he she was wrong, going oh well, I'll give it to Rhaenyra now, right, right. Yeah. Like I and I don't think anyone on the council or like anyone around her, they they would completely dismiss her. And I, I find it interesting, like if she knew that is Viserys was not naming Aegon King at that moment, he was not changing his mind in his dying breath. Mm. Would she have still made uh tried to make Aegon King because it, it was a lot of her doing it was a lot and I think potentially she would because I think she was afraid of Rhaenyra mm -hmm. so by being afraid of Rhaenyra she was like well I need to still keep power to keep her like and stuff so I can kind of see it on on that point of view and but. I think I think she does want power I think everyone in this show wants power like i said earlier yeah and it, and but when you when you think about it which is why i, I took parallels between her and cersei it's because every woman really doesn't have a lot of power in in game of thrones mm -hmm. so which is very interesting how you see how women can keep power and how because you all through history like women still have power but they're not openly doing it sometimes i'll just command their husbands and the husbands would do what they say so it's still them behind the scenes which is really interesting on how she's doing that but again i still think both alison and Rhaenyra are losing their threads of control on the people around them yes yes now what i think really what's really interesting about alison's position is she is literally fighting to uphold the patriarchy because that's where she found her power. And if yeah. that is not upheld, she loses her power. And I yeah. find that really interesting. But also, how much power does she really have? Because the ultimate authority is those around her, not her herself. And yeah, she is losing control. And she, you know, she maybe had... Kristen Cole under her thumb for a little bit but now that he's hand of the king he has a lot more power um Aegon is sitting on the throne and she's talking about how it's hard to control him like she is losing those around her and losing the control yeah, that yeah. she has especially especially with her son um Aegon because he wants war Rhaenyra doesn't Alicent really doesn't but he does because of what they they did to his heir He's like, I want them dead. I want war. Mm -hmm. It is war. Declares war. What well, everybody on the councils around him are like, well, right, right. do you not want to think about this first? Like, you know, how are we going to do with this? Uh, but she, Alison is losing it a little bit because other people are being too strong around her. But Nero is losing her control because she isn't making a decision. Yes. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. She doesn't quite know what she wants to do because I think whatever decision she's going to make, it will impact everything and probably really drive everything into war. And then there's no going back. She's like, oh, I've got to see this through. Or, you know, have the crown or die. So, and after still obviously grieving her son as well and everything that's going on and then worried about her other children, children it's kind of like, I'm trying to be everything at once when she's not really being a ruler first, a queen first. She's trying to do too many things at once. So I will be interested to see what decision she does make. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there a quote? There was a quote earlier, and I feel like it was said about Rhaenyra, and it was something, I think it was in the first episode of season two, something about whenever, uh, like whenever the the, mo the mother is grieving, like the queen isn't rolling or something. There was something along those lines. Oh, of like, yes. The fact that she's in mourning is preventing her from doing her duties as queen. There was. And then obviously we cut to her, like, grieving over her child and then getting herself back together. Even though you can't really get yourself back together after a loss such as that. So she's still trying to battle things, and I think that's still playing on her mind and still infect, infecting her decision she's going to make. So, But I'd be really keen to see what kind of decision she's going to make. And then 
what decision Damon's going to make because something's going to have to happen in that episode between him and the local rivalents. Yes. Obviously. Mm -hmm. Because they're all warring with each other. Uh Carly's old and frail, so it's like he's going to have to rear them together before the other army's marching, even though he knows nothing about the said army. Mm -hmm. So I would be curious to see how that would play out. If that would play out. Speaking of grieving, do we want to talk about Helena again? Oh, God. Still can't stand her. I... They didn't really do anything, I'm going to say, with the visions. Like, I was predicting. Like, she can see the future. They didn't really do anything with that. I'm wondering if they're trying to make her see like her character autistic or something like that if that was the case i'd be incredibly offended by that because it just comes across as she's dumb as shit see i don't read her as dumb (laughs) see i do (laughs) i don't think she's dumb i feel like there's a lot going on beneath the surface that she's not presenting yeah possibly she's just done done nothing to sort of stand out and she's just still obviously grieving and and again i don't know if it's direction if it's act, actress or what is going on but she just doesn't come across as somebody who is clever enough to know how to play the game so it feels like she just gets told what to do so she just does it and there doesn't seem to be any affection between her and her husband. She loves her kids, as any mother would. But at the same time, not doing anything to sort of change anything or protect them or, you know, she doesn't like crowds and stuff like that, which, you know, which is fair enough. But I don't know, she just, the way it's acted, I'm just like, are you, mm, no. I mean, she's like certainly not a leader. Interest. No, she's not. She's not a leader. She's not taking charge, despite her being the queen now. And and like we've said previously, she didn't. She doesn't have a lot to do. She's not really scheming behind the scenes or anything like that we're aware of. Um, so it, it does. I guess like I could. I could say like she comes off as like maybe a little bit boring. She's not the most interesting character in the show, uh, but I think a lot of that's just because we don't know. I'm I'm still holding out hope that there is more going on that we don't know about. And like whenever we watch back after knowing what happens, that this is all going to seem more interesting. That's that's my hope. See, I'm the opposite. I think she's just going to have these few little scenes to both weave through. Just to remind people that she does exist, rather than actually um, having any sort of agency in the show. It's my opinion. We'll have to see. Yeah, we'll have to see. Have to um, see. I'm I'm curious. So, okay, she comes in and then she talks about feeling guilty for grieving and like she doesn't have a right to grieve because, you know, people lose kids all the time and she's a queen and really privileged and all of that. And then Allison is like, you lost a kid, you're allowed to grieve and all of that. And, you know, they have like their conversation. And then Helena says, I forgive you to Allison. What do you think she was saying, I forgive you about? Because I thought. I mean, I'm going to say just at the moment, I thought she was yeah. saying it about the fact that like Alicent and Kristen Cole were like, she walked in on them and that he could have been protecting them and wasn't. And I thought maybe she was saying, I forgive you about that. But I saw discussion online that maybe she was saying like, I forgive you for not like being the mother I needed you to be for not being there for me or something like that. And I'm not really sure if she would say that about that like i don't know if we have like i'm gonna say the build-up for that but i found that interesting you know i do agree that that there wasn't the build-up for for that kind of um mother thing i'm the way i took it was she was forgiving her for what she did with Kristen cole because i've got a feeling that alluding that helena is going to become incredibly religious that especially after losing uh, losing a kid she could 
turn to religion in a sense to try and find a little bit of comfort where she won't find it anywhere else. And also, like, forgiving her for obviously putting her on, like, for spectation kind of thing to, like, get the grief back. There's also a lot it could be alluding oh. to, but that's what I kind of took it to. Because again, be Alison is. I like, forgive you for making her go out on the funeral possession. But, like, yeah. And Alison was the one who talked her into that, even though Alison herself didn't want to do it. You're right. She could very well be saying, I forgive you for the funeral possession. Yeah, I think it's more her and Kristen Cole, personally. Probably. But again, it's not, we, we don't have enough information to sort of really know why. And it's, it's, it's this is what it, what's kind of getting me a lot with, like, this episode, is it's alluding to a lot of things, and nothing's really giving any answers. It's just raising more questions, which is probably my, my main point, because I like promises and payoffs. So you make a promise or you raise a question and then you give me a little answer. It might not be the whole answer, but it'll be a slither or something that would then pull pull me through the show or the book. And that's how I that's how I do it. And that's where I think a lot of things just end up not clicking. So I'm like, well, it's, I'm more confused. <laughs> maybe than anything else. Maybe I like it because I love what ifs. I love what if. So like introductions to stories, there's so much potential. It could go anywhere, anywhere, it could go anywhere, it could go this way, it could go this way. Not that fascinating. Conclusions aren't always satisfying. Having answers is not always satisfying because like sometimes you'll get to the end and you'll be like, that was it. So I don't know. Maybe it's not, maybe I like it's, the setup like more whole, because there is a lot of setup. Yeah, it's not like the whole answer. It's just a slither of something of like a trickle of a little bit of information that would lead me to think, oh, could it be or could it be that? It's probably more, more of of what I like. But it's it's definitely a good point, and I I I want something more to come of Alison and Helena. But I don't mm. think we're going to get it. I hope that we do. Yeah, I'm not really sure what they. I'm not sure if it's going to happen this season. I'm not sure that they're going to do anything because they haven't really set up a whole lot. Helena doesn't have a whole lot to do. Um, no. And and I so maybe we're not going to get it this season. But I hope maybe by next season, like, she will come into a stronger character on her own. I'd like it. I just don't think we'd get it. <laughs> <laughs> Personally. But talking talking of Targaryens, what, what do you think of the new guy? The bastard of Balon? I don't have strong feelings on him. <laughs> he, he was have, there. Also, yeah. Eh. I think they inserted him there because I think he's going to have a bigger role later on because there was no other yeah. reason to put that in there. And I did like the scene where he was going on and like meeting everybody and da da da. And I'm kind of like, are you trying to scam somebody out of something and saying you're a Targaryen or are you really a Targaryen? It's one of those kind of like, oh, what ifs and or you know, trying to claim it or you know but i'd i'd like him to be an actual targaryen i'd like him to come into some sort of power to then go on rhaenyra's side probably because <laughs> <laughs> i think rhaenyra would be like yeah sure you'd be fine where i think aemon oh yeah because like she her has own. bastards of her own yeah <laughs> she's at the same time, I could very much see Rhaenyra, like, she's going to excuse her own, like, yeah, these are my kids. Everything's fine and legitimate here. And she's never going to admit to anything. But she might not be as forgiving for, like, other people because they could be threats to her. Yeah, but I like, think I'm... she... Mm, I don't think she'd go to the drastic side of... Like, when you look at Aegon, I think he'd just go, okay, I'm just going to kill you so you're not a threat. Whereas Rhaenyra would probably try and find an alternate. Like, send them to the wall or send them over to Pentos or, like, you know, don't be a problem. Um, because yeah, I can see that. they are alluding that she's a gentler heart, but she's not gentle. She's just more calculating. And mm -hmm. she's kind of like, I want to do best by my rule. So, and I think she has to be given more of a reason to take a drastic action. And I'm hoping they push her to that in the next episode. 
I, I feel like something has to eventually. Yeah. yeah and nothing... I feel like, if, I mean, we're kind of setting up to maybe the fighting starting without her. Uh, Kristen Cole is headed to Heron Hall. Damon is already in Heron Hall. Although that would just be the same thing that happened in the first episode of like Damon is taking the initiative and doing stuff anyway. And she's like sitting back and not really doing anything. So, I mean, in some ways I feel like something's going to happen to force her to take action, but at the same time, maybe it is just going to be like Damon taking action. <laughs> well, see what I kind of predict is because she's like, let's see what Damon says or does, or if he can get, because that's what he's gone. He's gone to the Riverlands to get them. I've got a suspicion he'll, if he succeeds in taking the Riverlands and uniting them, he'll turn on Rhaenyra. And then Rhaenyra will be in an even worse position. That is possible. And then she'll probably be really like, that would be a strong blow to her because she's lost a dragon, lost an ally, and he's taken the River Riverlands. Okay, but what claim does Damon have to the throne without Rhaenyra? Well, he'd be the brother of um, Viserys. So he could say yeah, without and but, male But heir, he has a be... legitimate son that's currently on the throne. Mm -hmm. So until that son is dead and his other uh, Aemond is dead too, what claim does Damon have to the throne without Rhaenyra? When you put it, if you're going down direct line of succession, no, but at the same time, he's felt the crown pass over his head multiple times. He could just kind of go, fuck it, I'm going to take it. Like he Aegon could. the Conqueror did. He well, Aegon the Conqueror true. did. He came to uh, King's Landing and then basically with two of his dragons and his two wives, he just took all of all of Westeros. Because he had dragons. I mean, the other side's got dragons, so it's not going to work in this case, but I could kind of see that, and I can kind of see in that being a really big blow to Rhaenyra. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Especially if she doesn't make a decision soon on what to do, because she'll lose her counsellors, and then Damon will turn their back on her, and then, then they'll be like, what the fuck are we going to do? She'll probably lose some counsellors because of that. They'll go, well, you're in a worse position. I'm going to go and get a better position and survive. On oh, that. I don't know. I'm just not loving, loving it. I just, I'm just expecting a hell of a lot more. Well, maybe we'll get that next episode. <laughs> I think they're focusing a fair amount this season on. I'm going to say how it affects the small folk, how it affects the people yeah. around those in power, and I feel like I, I have really noticed that emphasis this season. So I don't know if we're how much we're going to continue. Like, obviously, I think we're going to continue to do that to some extent. But, yeah, I, I do feel like we, we have to be leading up to a major clash. By the, by the end of this season, I think we're at least going to have, like, major conflict. Um, pop, I think we are. Hopefully major dragon I'm... battle. <laughs> oh, yeah. But what I want is a few major strong moments either politically character motivation or battles before so otherwise you're dragging me through this and i'm like what is going on i'm a little bit bored whereas if they really drove in more on the intensity of everything like the strain between everyone like rhaenyra her counselors rhaenyra and daemon Rhaenyra with the greens, like everything really strain it. Same with Alison. Then I'd probably be a lot more invested. But at the moment, it's just feeling very like mediocre. I feel like there is a lot of tension in a lot of those scenes, and I feel like we can like start to see like the power crumbling around them. There's uh, some tension. I just want it to be like racked up a lot more. That's fair. That's fine. But that's that's just me. I mean, hoping episode four. It's going to be a lot better, but we'll have to we'll have to see. Yeah, it was sort of the same on season one. It got about four or five episodes in, and then it really hooked me. So maybe, maybe, what do you know? Yeah. Season one, I did feel like took its time to uh, 
set up the story and really like take off like I felt like the end of season one was a lot stronger than the beginning. So yeah. maybe that will happen here again. <laughs> I'm hoping but it's I, happen here again. I still feel like I'm enjoying the beginning of season two more than I enjoyed the beginning of season one. Hmm. Probably. Well, they're probably around the same. Like, I'm intrigued enough, but I'm not like, oh my god, it's amazing, kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. where I am. But, I don't know. I'm still, still going to watch it. I mean, it's got dragons, I'm going to watch it. Yes. <laughs> watch it for the dragons. <laughs> All the dragons. Uh, so, but yeah, it'll be interesting. Well, I think that is a good place to end this. Uh, would you like mm -hmm. to tell the people how to find you on the internet? So I'm Lady May Reads on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. And they just, again, scream about books, review a lot of books. And it's basically my jam. Well, hope to see everyone in a, another video and happy reading.